Well, thank you guys, and thank you, Janet, thank you, Atlas, for uh, having us here. And uh, the whole theme of pivot, like that's what the, the meeting's about, is hey, what are you gonna do to pivot in the market? So I have been through a couple of market changes in, in other businesses in the past, and I've learned that, hey, when the market changes, you have to pivot with it, and usually the faster you pivot, the better off you are. So the last year, year and a half, as interest rates started going up, I started looking at ways to pivot in the new market. So I uh, really last six months, I got strong clarity on what I'm doing, the moves I'm making. And I started telling people, hey, I'm, I'm doing this. Uh, and one of my pivots is I am selling a lot of my rental properties. And people are like, holy crap, wh why are you doing that? I'm like, well, give me 10 minutes, I'll tell you why. They're like, oh, that actually makes a lot of sense. Tell me that again. And so, you know, it, it goes from, hey, what's worked in the past market to what has worked now? And so I am doing a big pivot. So I'm gonna go through a lot of data uh, that I have looked at the last year and a half in general for what I'm doing right now. Uh, talk about my thinking to hopefully simulate the ideas and have some good conversation here. Because I have learned uh, I pivot fast and I pivot hard. I know a lot of the people, like they don't pivot quite as fast as I do. So hopefully this facilitates uh, some really great discussion. And also, I'm doing a massive business pivot. So I'm pivoting myself as an investor, selling a lot of rentals. And I'm also making some very big business moves uh, to follow the investor trends. So two big pivots here, all because uh, my thesis is that 2008, or I should say a 2008 style-like crash is happening again. And so I've been asking myself, hey, it's going to happen again. Am I ready for it? And so I am prepared. Now my question is, are you and your portfolio ready for it? So uh, the agenda uh, is put into the three main buckets how I analyze things. One is what's happened in the past, both in the market and for me as a person and investor. We have to learn from the past. Second, what is the current state of the market? Uh, what's happening right now? And then third, where's it going? Where are the opportunities in the market? And where are the opportunities for me and my thesis is you go through those three things and that gives you a very clear road, roadmap to go out there and potentially pivot your investing in your business. Of course, I have to give you this uh, disclaimer. Uh, this is all educational, it's informative. Uh, talk to your CPA, your lawyer, you know, for all the details. I'm gonna be sharing numbers and data and this is all stuff I've sourced myself and models I've built. But go talk to a professional like Jen to make your portfolio moves. All right, so my name is Chris Lopez. A lot of you know me through the Envision Advisors, which is an investor-friendly team I've built on the brokerage. Uh, last couple of years, a lot of you have got to know me through Property Llama, which is really cool software that helps you analyze your real estate portfolio. It's financial planning for your portfolio. Now, what I'm most known for is the Denver Real Estate Investing Podcast. And this is like my baby. I love it because I get to meet so many people around town and I get to learn from them. I get to learn from all these great people who are more successful than me, who have taken more black eyes than me in the past. And I get to learn from them. And I see a couple of people that have been on the podcast as well. And then all of this data and getting to meet lots of very, very successful and smarter than people than me has really impacted what I focus on as let me go out there and teach all the stuff like the Bigger Pockets platform and really carve out a really cool niche around uh, rental portfolio optimization. It's hey, how do you go out there and buy stuff, buy properties, a lot of us know how to do that. And we go out there and now look at, hey, we now have a portfolio that's worth millions of dollars. We've had all this massive appreciation. What do we do with it? And that's really my passion and that's really a lot of like the content I work on uh, you know, with clients and you know, with bigger pockets. And so while I go through this, uh, this is about 10 to 15 minute presentation. I'm happy to go all the way through, but if I say something, you guys have some questions, raise your hand, interrupt me. I'm, I'm happy for Q and A as well. Then we'll sit down and uh, I'll be put in the hot seat and don't be shy with questions. Uh, the winner who stumps me gets a prize. So here's a really good thing to keep in mind. We talk about lessons from 2008. This is a great quote. History doesn't repeat itself, but it often rhymes. Is 2008 gonna happen exactly like it did? No, but there'll be some similarities to it that will rhyme, so we should learn from it. So I wanna kinda of tell the story through uh, the real estate trend. So this is the last 50 years of Denver real estate prices. The purple line is condos. Uh, the solid line are single family homes. So you can see in that red dot, that is the crash. 
uh, that small line there, you know, which was like the end of the world going off a cliff 15 years ago, doesn't look that big anymore. And so we had the crash, and then we had this massive appreciation and rent growth. So that's the quick history there. And before I talk more about this, I want to kind of give you the genesis of my story, and that was when I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Anyone else read Rich Dad, Poor Dad? Did it change anyone else's like, life like it did for me? Like I read that book, and it was just a like two by four across the face. Because um, I went to Virginia Tech to be an engineer and to go in the military. Both did not work out for uh, various reasons. But Rich Dad, Poor Dad got me obsessed with financial freedom. I was like, wow. There's a better way to go out there and like live a life. I can invest. I can have a business. I don't have to just have a, a job, and that's all I have to do. So that just set me off on a crazy journey. Originally, I wanted to go do real estate investing, but I was like 21. You know, I was 20 at the time, had no money, and the internet wasn't around like it was today. So I pivoted towards building a business and actually graduated not needing a job. Uh, and my key to success there was in 2002, 2003 timeframe, I rode one of these early internet growth waves. This was still like AOL CD-ROM days. Uh, Yahoo was still bigger than Google. Like I caught a really good time in the internet where good opportunity, good product, some really good mentors, and I just grew and had a lot of success with the internet, which allowed me to graduate college not needing a job and really do some fun stuff. But the main point here, and I classify this as like a Lopez law, so as I go through and do really good things, really bad things, I mentally fire away a law in my mind. So one of the biggest laws I learned is the trend is your friend. Uh, and I originally learned that when I tried stock trading and I didn't make any money on there. But then I look back and I made money in that way on like the big trends. Who else has stock traded before, right? You know this quote, right? And you think it's your friend and it's not in stock trading. So I bought my very first property in 2011 for $67,000. Uh, it was a condo, so it'll actually lower down the line. And I bought that not because I was ready to go into full-time real estate investing, but I knew like, hey, prices are crashing. Everyone's saying don't buy. I can buy a place for way cheaper than I can rent. This is a no-brainer. So I bought a place, and then next couple of years, I was still doing my old internet business. And in 2014, that's when like, the real estate bug bit me, when I was like, oh, man. This is it. This is what I got to get into. So I spent the next three years, 2014, 15, 16, figuring out my way into real estate. I did a fix and flip, made money, hated it. I did wholesaling. You know, I made a $18,000 commission on $70,000 worth of uh, marketing expenses. So that wasn't a great deal. Uh, I did multifamily brokerage for a few months, uh, and I loved multifamily, but I did not enjoy being a junior broker and just cold calling all day. I was like, guys, I built like two multi-million dollar internet businesses. There's this thing called YouTube. No, we don't do that. I was like, oh, this is insane. But I eventually hit my stride on buying rental properties, and I learned about like return equity. So from 2017, when I kind of hit my groove, I turned about $100,000 into over a million dollar portfolio. Not through a lot of creative deal making, but really through return on equity, which is we're in a hyper growth market, you can recycle your equity. And this was like another law of mine is, hey, get, good at, get really good at one thing. And if that one thing goes with the trend, you're gonna make money. And that one thing with the trend will handle a lot of F ups along the way to put it very bluntly. So I focused on that and I really became obsessed with it. And I just like, wow, this is, this, is, this is it. This is how all these people go out there and they go from a you know, million dollars to 10 million to 100 million dollars as I saw people go out there and do it. It wasn't buy a property and pay it off. So I built hundreds of spreadsheets in different iterations. And at times I felt like it was in the matrix. I just built a spreadsheet, I'd model, built a spreadsheet, i model it. And they were a very complex beast. Uh, but I sat down with hundreds of clients, some of you guys in the room here, and help you figure out what to do with your property, what to do with your portfolio, how do you maximize your return equity? And all this was so successful, it's what helped me go out there and build my portfolio. And then we had so much traction and also a lot of growing pains from the spreadsheets where spreadsheets are great, but when you have hundreds of spreadsheets with hundreds of people, you have lots of issues, especially when people start breaking them. And that turned into software called Property Llama. And this is the software we use to analyze property. So, I will highlight this a few times throughout there. So you'll see some screenshots. Just understand this was built out of writing the trend and that one thing that no one was talking about, which was how do you maximize your equity? Have I lost anyone? All right. 
So there's a, just a screenshot of a portfolio kind of show you what it looks like. So this is, I think, four or five properties in here and kind of shows you, hey, here are these four rentals. Here are how they're performing. And it's a blended 4% cap rate. So it gives you a really good bird's eye view. So bringing us to the present day here, that was the history. Hey, huge wave growth. Ride the trend. Ride the pop. Um, and then we had these unicorn years when you know, interest rates went close to zero. And now the appreciation party is over. So this is present day, right? So huge run up, and now prices are flattening out. And so another thing I keep in mind, you know, another Lopez law, and I like this from like mutual funds, is past performance is no guarantee of future results. Now we all know that from investing in mutual funds, but I tell that to myself constantly when it comes to my own investing and my own business. Because like, cool, I did all this over here. Doesn't mean crap today. If what I did no longer works, all right, then I have to pivot. So what I did in the past, even though I built a seven-figure portfolio, a seven-figure business, doesn't mean squat in the future if that no longer works. And so keep this in mind as we go through, because this is a big part of like my thinking and something I want to challenge you guys to use to talk about deals, because until about six months ago, I was like, oh, when rates drop, when rates drop was my mantra. And I was like, oh, wait, what am I talking about here? I'm, I'm stuck in this trap. So this brings us here to the question, are Colorado prices about to crash? Who says yes? Who says no? That's an overstatement, cash. Cash? Crash. Crash? What's the percentage of crash? Yeah, it was stable. Yeah. Uh, I would say prices fall more than 10%. They'll fall more than 10%? Is it gonna fall more than 20%? 25%? We're not that lucky, man. Um, so my prediction is there's no crash happening like it did in 2008 in residential properties because that's where the massive crash was and the opportunity a lot of us got a lot of, you know, got rich off of last decade. So prices are very stable. Uh, I can go through a bunch of data. If you want hundreds of pages of data, I give it to you. My prediction in the next couple of years, prices are stabilized. We'll see mass appreciation, one, two, three, four percent a year for the next handful of years because the law of averages are coming back. We had double digit growth, the law of averages come back to play. So there's a bunch of uh, firms out there that all predict, you know, MOS depreciation. And I'd say the consensus from a lot of people and, and big, smarter companies than us, uh, basically the crash was last year. This time last year, prices dropped zero to 5%. That was the bottom. In my best guess, I'll bet a beer on that. Uh, and the other thing going on, prices are going to be flat. The other thing, rents are flat now. Like we had hyper rent growth, right? It was amazing. By the time your lease came up, you were already $100 behind market rent a year ago. It was nuts. Vacancy is going up, so rent pressure is going down. The other thing that's incredibly interesting from a rent stabilization and also price stabilization is I was talking to a couple property managers. I'd be curious to know what Atlas has on this stat, Jen. Uh, two property managers that were not Atlas and don't manage as many doors as Atlas does, I was talking to them and I said, hey, what are you seeing in the market? And they're like, you know, it's all pretty much the same. We're not seeing a lot of landlords sell. Uh, some are a lot still buying. They both said, this is the biggest uptick we've ever seen in new landlords. And these are people who are converting their 3% primary to a, a, a rental. And so they're just like, they're both, they both said it's the biggest they've ever had. Are you guys seeing that, do you know? I know you're more on the broker side, Jen. We are seeing like the C class right now getting kind of crushed with expenses and yep. people moving out of Colorado back to whatever state they came from that's cheaper. That they can than afford? Colorado. <laughs> yeah. Yes, but with the owners that I'm meeting with, they do not want to sell their properties that have the 3% rate, which a lot of times is really smart. But I'm not seeing a lot of new acquisition here, but yeah. we're focused on real big portfolios. So we yeah, take no, over you're like on the, yeah. 500, 700 at a time. Yeah. So uh, the other thing too, and this is more of a public service announcement, there is some really strong uh, anti-landlord landlord headwinds coming out of Colorado. This has been our best podcast this year. I'd recommend if you guys want to scan the QR code, it'll take you to YouTube or podcast number 472. But we interviewed a guy who runs a nonprofit uh, an advocacy group. And he went through like nine things last year, a couple things down coming on the pipeline. And it's just, it's sobering to put it politically correct. 
And so here's the reality that we all know. It's tough to find a good cash flowing rental in today's market. The easy days of, hey, plop down 20% of cheap debt and ride the growth, those days are over, right? What worked in the past is not gonna work in the future. So it took me nine months to really realize that. Now it's on two slides. So where is the opportunity? Where is this 2008 style crash? It's happening in commercial properties. It's happening in apartment buildings. It's happening in basically a lot of asset classes that are not residential. And a big part of that too is because we all know what interest rates did. While individual landlords say, I got this 30 year 3% fixed rate, commercial people have a three year floating rate and now they're getting wham. So this is where the opportunity is. So this is another Denver chart. The uh, green line is uh, duplexes, triplexes, fourplexes. This dotted line is apartment buildings, so like five units or greater. Now what's really interesting here is that in 2008, um, you know, multifamily did not go through a big crash. And that was like one of their big selling points last decade is they did not go through a crash in 2008. Guess who's going through a crash right now? So you can exactly see what happened here. Interest rates got cheap. Prices went up, prices are coming down. Like it is, you know, it's a pyramid uh, formation. So prices are going down there. So what we wanna do is buy distressed properties, buy when low. Like we're buying Denver apartment buildings at 2019 prices, which is nutty. And if anyone wants this full slide deck, I can send it to you and I got tons of charts and graphs. So here's an example one to give you guys a, a, a reality. Uh, so this is a 32 unit apartment building in North Denver, like 20 minutes north of here. Uh, and it's on Samuel Drive and we're basically doing the Burr strategy. So buy, rehab, rent, refinance, repeat. Well, that's how a lot of people did in single family. They go buy a single family home, refinance it and repeat. And that's how a lot of us did rentals. Who did a rental like that in residential the last decade, right? So almost half of us. And it was an amazing strategy. Who's doing burrs right now? Cool, they're still finding some. A lot less people are though. So Stan go in there, fix it up. You know, it's a legacy owner, $500 under market rent, clear the building, fix it up, raise the rents. And so we bought the building right here. Is that the bomb of the crash? Probably not, but still good value. The numbers make sense, it's on the way down. So my question to myself and you guys is, what if you could buy properties like it was in 2008 again? Now the trick is it's not in residential, but it's gonna be a lot of opportunity in commercial. And I know you're putting another commercial fund, right? I mean, you're seeing probably the same, you're in Chicago, right? Chicago, Minneapolis. Are you have seen similar trends? Yeah, but it's like commercial is such a broad industry, right? Yeah. So office space, traffic. Yes. <laughs> so if you invest in medical and some others, yep. they are holding much more strength. Yep. So after COVID, like, if you have option to stay home, office space crashing, retail crashing, uh, Amazon, uh, these things hit. But medical properties, daycare, they have very Yep. Like I said, there, yeah, some asset classes are crashing, some are not. So that's, I'm a big believer, hey, I want to buy cheap, right? We want to buy value, we want to buy cheap. So I got in serious about investing in 2017. So more than halfway through this last run up. And I said this to myself numerous times, man, I wish I could go back in time. I'm sure we've all said that, right? Once or twice or a thousand times to us. But I'm like, hey, when this happens, I'm gonna be ready for it. Because I had that same attitude 10 years before my old business. And hey, it's gonna happen, it's gonna happen, it's gonna happen when it is, I'm gonna be ready for it. So I've been waiting for this. So this brings me to my pivot, where I am liquidating over uh, about half my portfolio right now, between two weeks ago and the next 100 days, I'm hopefully selling three or four properties. And here is the whole idea, to put it simply. The left chart here really shows the equity growth in residential properties. This is just a, a national chart. That red line is debt, the yellow line is equity. And I think the, you know, there's all sorts of stats out there, but there's so many heavy equity properties out there. And I'm gonna take the equity, so I'm gonna sell high, move the equity and buy low over here into commercial assets. And so that is my whole thesis right there. So how do I get my equity that I built over here and how do I get it over to here? And so I wrote Denver residential and now the opportunity is in not just Denver commercial but nationwide commercial in certain asset classes. 
And so here's a screenshot from, these are actually three of my properties I wanna sell, uh, I'm going to sell, uh, in the Property Llama software. So about a million dollars in total valuation, you know, close to $500,000 equity, and it's a blended 5% cap rate. And these are all three to 4% interest rates. So I'm one of the people actually selling cheap it debts right now. And three years ago, four years ago, five years ago, I bought the interest rates down from 4% to 3%. I bought them down like a lot of us did. And I'm doing what I ever thought I would, I'm selling them. I was like, dude, I'll hold this for like 10 years. What are you talking about, lender? Of course I'm gonna hold on to it. Nope, I'm selling. Um, because the opportunity is so good. So this is a, uh, I could spend an hour going through all the details, but this is the executive summary of it. Even taking in some transaction cost uh, and some capital gain stuff, depreciation recapture, that blue line shows my current portfolio of those three rentals that I'm, I'm disposing of. That yellow line is my projected returns investing in like the commercial deals. Um, and so you can see over the long run, assuming I kind of follow that trend, the long-term cash or the long-term growth is just, the difference is massive. So yes, holding on to the 3% interest rate, I wouldn't say is a bad move, but it's not gonna be the most productive from a wealth building standpoint. And that's something I challenge everyone to look at. Uh, and if you want to, put your properties in software, analyze it. But yes, you might be saving a dime, but you're losing a dollar, so to speak. So as I said at the beginning, uh, when I've been telling people this, they're like, wow, these are big changes. Yeah. Just a quick question on that. Are you gonna sell those properties with the loan, being, keeping the loan in place? Is that, are you looking at that? No. Um, like doing a subject to it's, these are all like Fannie Freddie loans. So it's very hard to do that. So they're conventional loans. Uh, and these are rental properties. And since they've appreciated so much, I've been getting the tenants out, remodeling the property and selling it to an owner occupant. I want top dollars investor and I'll get top dollar by selling to another investor. I get top dollar cause these are condos and single family homes. So I'm gonna sell it to retail now. Yeah. Um, so I've been telling people this, we're like, wow. These are some big changes. And that's basically what everyone's response. We're like, I need to digest this. Troy Miller here, who's unfortunately here, was the same thing. He's like, wow, those are big changes. He's like, hey, but the message you're saying here, the pivot, the change, like this is, this is great stuff. Can you come teach iCore members about this? I was like, I would absolutely love to. Uh, and because like, I have really gotten full belief in this data the last six months. Uh, now I wanna go out there and teach it because like, I'm a big believer in you share, it brings ideas, it brings people together. And you know, more people you know in real estate, the more money you make. So one of the things that uh, Troy and I and Jen have been talking about is, I know one of, the, one of i -Corps moves, they wanna move more towards like uh, hands-on masterminds, hands-on activities uh, for like beginner investors, uh, uh, people with portfolios. So we are going to do uh, a round of a investor mastermind with, with I-Corps members who want to pivot with a market shift. Now the whole point is how people go through and like, hey, let's take a look at the data, take a look at your portfolio, and then bring it up to speed and actually sit down and analyze it. And then have other people analyze well and kind of swap ideas, right? I'm a big believer in like, the more you learn from others and the more you teach others, the more you earn. So I'm a big believer in mastermind. So we are doing, uh, what it comes out to is that we are going to uh, focus first on understanding your portfolio, because that is the number one thing to focus on. Hey, what is your portfolio? What are your goals? And that's gonna be done a lot through the property llama account, because that's the analytical stuff. And then the masterminds help us discuss and figure things out. So again, here's a screenshot of, uh, you know, of a portfolio and there of a four rental portfolio. Uh, hey, how can we analyze? And this is the global view. Then we'll dry, drill down to each property to understand, hey, how's it going? And a lot of it is people just need to rebalance their portfolio. You may not be like drastic item and sell all your properties, but you may sell one or two, you may rebalance things. Because in stock accounts and 401ks, they auto rebalance, right? They auto reinvest the dividends. Doesn't happen in real estate. My rent checks don't auto reinvest. My portfolio is not auto rebalance based on demographics. I have to go in there and do it. And real estate is, you know, it's hard and expensive transacting. So we can get the data in there. It allows us to run a bunch of scenarios, uh, do what we call like simple scenario model. Like, hey, if I were to do this with a property or my portfolio, how is that impacted? And it's meant to be very conceptual and visual. So you can see, wow, this does 
In this example, this portfolio move, I get, this person gets their goal in 10 years versus 25 years. Okay, that's eye-opening. That's worth digging into deeper and then really getting all the numbers and digging in deeper. So if main focus is understanding your portfolio, doing a deep dive on the Denver trends, whatever trends you're in, or you know, market you're in. We know Colorado really, really well, and just some like macro asset classes. We have a real estate course that teaches a lot of these key concepts that I've taught over the years. This is just something like teachable account, so it's a great way to get some like great education uh, without having to do live stuff where the masterminds, the software, that has hands on, that's interactive. That's, hey, let's meet here at six o'clock and meet this. This is, hey, do it on your own schedule where it fits you, your schedule while you're driving into work. So understanding your portfolio, a lot of the mechanics of all the stuff we talked about, but just the educational standpoint. And then do a deep dive into passive investing or going into commercial assets, uh, because that is where the trend is going. And while there's a lot of similarities, there's a lot of a, a, uh, rhyme, you know, a lot of this rhymes with the stuff we've done, it's a different asset class. They're structured differently. It's different debt. It's different capital stacks. It's very different. So like I spent the last two years learning how to underwrite these deals uh, from a part like the asset level and on the bigger uh, passive level. So like that apartment building we did, here's a screenshot of it. Hey, how do you underwrite a 32 unit apartment building burr? Well, we'll go through that. And then We'll end with trying to do some hands-on stuff with getting some people that know these asset classes. And a lot of times we can go walk these properties. This was us actually walking that apartment building last year, or actually about this time last year, we actually went and walked Samuel Drive. And so just like we like to go out there and walk a property, you know, it's easy if it's MLS, go walk the property. Walking an apartment building or a medical office building, a little harder to walk, but uh, we try to incorporate this in here so people can understand what the asset classes are. So we don't have a start date for it yet, but it's going to be sometime in January. Uh, there are going to be small groups, uh, and we are thinking six weeks, about $300, and it's geared for people with two or more rentals. It'll be a hybrid of using the software, masterminds, and also getting together to like actually go out there and discuss things. So it's meant to be very hands-on, and the goal is by the end of it, you have a clear understanding of like how your portfolio is performing. You have a clear understanding at where your goals, where your goals are, and how to make your portfolio get to your goals. And between us, the teachers, and your fellow peers, you hopefully got some ideas and had some people play devil's advocate to your portfolio and to their portfolio while really understanding some of the new opportunities in the market so you can make the right moves. Again, I'm not saying it has to be drastic like I'm doing, uh, but like if you don't pivot with the market, I'm sorry, you're missing out on a huge, huge opportunity, and you have to pivot. Uh, and then, one last thing here before we get into the, uh, the hot seat, is another law I have is I make a plan and I pivot fast. I think that's been one of my, my superpowers over the years. And I really learned that because in this time frame of my life, I bought my first property in 2011, and I got serious about real estate in 2014. Those three years in between, I call it purgatory. That, and that was Lopez purgatory. It was the lowest point or rock bottom point I've ever been as an entrepreneur. Now, and I was just in a funk, I wasn't happy, I was frustrated, uh, because what happened was I was still doing my whole internet business and all those trends have changed. Just like we've had the same huge market shift change on us here in Denver, similar stuff in those days, but I was holding on. It's kind of like if you ever dated anyone and then like you should have broken up, you know, a couple months before, I just struggled over three years. And it was just miserable for me. And once I made the, the shift to pivot, I was happier. I started making more money and being more productive. So that led me to like, hey, if things have changed, man, change with it. Like don't sit there and do nothing and hold on to because like no matter how much I want, I ain't changing the market, right? And so I will talk about this very, very briefly here. And this leads me to my second pivot, which is a massive business pivot, where a lot, while I did all that stuff to grow my wealth, um, you know, for my portfolio, and then I started the Envision Advisors, which helped hundreds of clients go out there and transact in hundreds and hundreds of properties, uh, grew a lot of stuff there. Like we help people buy and sell rentals, house acts, small multifamilies. But that business is not the best in the current market cycle with these asset classes. So I'm pivoting towards past investing 
with property development. So I'm making a business pivot where, hey, while I love rentals, I love the market, the problem is the trends don't love me anymore. The trends don't love that business. So I have to, I'm pivoting as an investor and I'm pivoting as a business as well. And so both of those are like, I mean, they are multiple seven figure pivots for me. We look at like the equity in the portfolio and the business, like that does like seven figures plus or multiple seven figures a year in, in, in commissions and fees. So these are huge, massive pivots for me. And I'm sharing this with you, uh, not to convince you, not to try to brag, not to do anything, but just say, hey, I'm making massive pivots and hopefully make you think, wow, should you be making pivots? So with that, put me in the hot seat. High level, who, th who thinks I'm crazy? No one? Semi-crazy? You, is that, is that you saying yes or a question? Oh, okay. Can you tell me why those, uh, I'm assuming those are multifamily, uh, the commercial, yeah. that has dropped so much. What has caused that? Because as we know. <clears throat> why prices have dropped so much? Uh, a lot of it's the increase in interest rates. So a lot of people, you know, 2017, 2018, 2019, 2020, even 21, they bought properties and a lot of times they'll be anywhere from like, you know, a one year to a seven year fixed rate. Um, and so they bought these properties three, four percent, um, a lot of times interest only. And then they just had like a, a, a lot of times a triple whammy. So as uh, what's happened is the high rent growth is over, expenses have gone up, taxes gone up, Freaking insurance bills have gone up. So their rates are resetting. They're not hitting the rent growth they're expecting and they have more expenses. So a lot of these people, they can't like, the bank's saying, oh, you want to refinance this? That's a $2 million cash in refinance. And a lot of people can't do it. And so typical thing, cheap debt. And uh, I mean, multifamily syndication was a very, very trendy thing the last five, seven years. And for a lot of the inexperienced people, hey, they, they're, they're getting bit by it. And so now they can't, uh, they can't afford the property. Yes, sir. Thanks for the presentation. Yeah. Are you, uh, are, speaking of syndicating, are you syndicating those multifamilies that you're buying? Yeah, yeah. I'm doing, so, yep. Okay. How are you differentiating yourself right now? Uh, it seems like because it's been so popular, multifamily investor syndicators are kind of down a dozen to a lot of investors. <laughs> yes. Uh, great question. The short answer on that is, I think this is a great time because a lot of syndicators are sitting on the sideline right now, and a lot of people are like kind of getting, they're losing their buildings right now. I was thinking the metaphor of like, hey, the tide's gone out, now you see he's not wearing a bathing suit. Um, and so like when things are crashing, um, I think that's the best time to hop in there. So we're very much focused on, hey, where are the fundamentals? Where are the plans? Who are the operators that, hey, they've been doing this for a long time, but they haven't lost money. They bought the deals right still. Like there's people that bought right during here and there's a lot of people that bought wrong. It's really focusing on the ones that, hey, here are the opportunities, here are the people that bought right and we continue doing it. A 20 unit building up, like you said it was north of Denver. Yeah. What kind of cap rate are you buying on that these days? Uh, for this, I don't even know the cap rate because it was so like, since the value add on the buy side, the cap rate doesn't matter. Cash flow out gate or anything. No, no. So like this property itself, this was, I think it was a five, I don't know, Matt, five million dollar? Five or six. Yeah, five to six. I think it was like five million and six million with like rehab budget in it. About five million purchase price, about a million dollar rehab budget. I don't know the cap rate because it's a 30, you know, legacy owner. Um, units were updated in the 80s. Rents are, you know, what they were, 500, 600 dollars below market. So, I mean, it was a horrible cap rate. But the plan was going there. It takes about a year to uh, fix it up, rent it out, and then stabilize it. So the the going in cap rate doesn't matter since it's not like a turnkey uh, turnkey place. So I don't know the cap rate, uh, but right now stabilized, it's like a five to five and a half cap rate in the current economic model. And of course, that might drift up some too, as you know, rates do what they do. But that's best guess right now. It's about a five to five and a half cap rate. Yeah, and Matt's in this deal back here as well. So Matt, if you have any more details, chime in. Uh, uh. Just, yeah, just find deals with, with, uh, with good debt on them. Well. Right, so that, that, like that particular one, where a lot of these deals that do it, they're getting owner carry, seller finance, yeah. with some really, really attractive low rates on them. In a lot of cases, those sellers are carried back the bottom of that. So they get deals 10% down, 10% equity of the deal. 
had a pitcher stop with pitch rate for five years on those about ten, four to five. So that's that that can survive this you know experience the next five years. One thing I do want to mention, like, um, okay, I left these over here. One thing, if anyone wants to really commit to pivoting, this is a book we publish every year, and I would love if everyone writes a chapter in here, but there are, we had about 40 investors last year, and the whole idea here is you sit here and write your, your investing plan, your business plan, your goals. Because thinking and verbalizing your plan is one thing, Writing it down is a lot hard to make it clarifying, and then sharing it publicly so two thousand other people read it, you know, is a lot, uh, you know, is a lot higher commitment. So, like, I started doing this myself six years ago. I wrote my own uh, investing plan. Like, it was like the best blog content I ever wrote on the blog post. Like, wow, there's something here. And then we turned into a book. We had lots of people write their chapters. So I love it because like it gets people coming into like, hey, what's your plan? Uh, what are you changing? You write it down so you have clarity on there. It's amazing networking because you can read other people's uh, chapters in here. They read your chapters. So amazing networking, amazing deal making. And then also, like, I'm a big believer in, like, if you don't write down your goals, whether it's financial, if you don't write down your workout plan for the week, like, you get better results and write things down. So if anyone wants a copy, uh, we can pass them out. But also, I'd love people to write a chapter. C could you grab a couple of these, Matt, and maybe pass them out, if you guys don't mind? And then, Jen, I know how you want to do the hot seat. If you got a list of questions or open up to the audience, but like, I also really want to keep it focused to like what you guys are doing as well. One of my questions would be, I got into real estate vesting on accident, right? Because I couldn't sell my property during the last recession. And then I found out like it was building wealth and it was starting to make sense. And it became like this little nest egg. Yep. And how else do you have both time and money if you don't have multiple things working for you? Like, especially... As a woman, I have like demands of the job and the family and the, the house and the dog and all of the things like you can't duplicate yourself. So you have to have like these little things working for you. What is your why? How did you get into this and what drives you to give back so much? Like you can just I can sense how intelligent no. you are. And I'm very blessed that you came and you're sharing your story and, oh. and helping these people. Um, thank you. I mean, it's I mean, it's a lot of the standard stuff but like I. I, I love teaching. Um, I've also had a lot of mentors in my life where they were super impactful to me. You know, I can think of Jason and Charles and Steve in my past. They were very impactful to me. So, like, I'm a big believer in that karma thing. The biggest reason is it's just, it's a game. It's fun. Like, I'm a competitive person. I played sports in college. I played sports in high school. I played sports in Little League. Um, no chance of professional sports career, um, unfortunately. No chance to go perform, you know, uh, on a big stage or the big field. Um, and then so, like, this is, like, my version of the game I can play. And plus, I can play this game until I'm 100 years old. You know, I can't. And you're winning. Yeah. And you're well, helping other people win at the same time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I, I try. I think, yeah, definitely went in there. Just help. It's just, it's just enjoyment. Like, and for me, like, I'd say the biggest thing, because I also have, I have a couple young kids, so I'm trying to, like, hey, how can I instill values in them? And I boil it down for me, I realized, is, like, I need purpose. Like, I need something to do. Like, I'm a dog with a ball. If you just throw the ball, I need that. If I don't have anyone throwing the ball for me and I'm idle, um, I become unhappy. I become grumpy. Uh, my wife will attest to this. Um, and I'm just not a happy person. So like, I, I need purpose. I need a game to play. And this is like the funnest game in the world to me. Cause I can like, you know, play my own game and like, you can help other people go out there and achieve their goals and the ripple effect to go out there and whatever charities people invest in. It's just a fun game in my mind. And I also like to make money. So like, I want to be very clear about that. Like I, I give back, I play by the rules, but I'm also a capitalist. And you know, the more you give, the more you get. There were some hands up. Do yeah. you have some questions? Right, yes, yes, sir. Um, how long do you think you'd be deploying the strategy? Is this kind of like a forever plan, or is this kind of a reaction to what you're seeing in the market now? Um, my best guess is probably seven to 10 years. Uh, and this is just based off of like, Again, I'm 42 in a couple months, so like I've gone through a couple major shifts, and it seems like seven years has been like major shifts in my life and business and market, and also just like looking at the, uh, I mean, I don't know, it's how long the trend goes for. I mean, like, well, your notes are going to be five-year notes on your commercial properties. Are huh. oh, you talking about specific assets or the well, trend in general? I was, I was going to say that, it, that with the. Uh, 
the notes coming due, and you know it, that is oftentimes the time for yeah. evaluation, reevaluation, get rid of it, keep it, yep. update it, change it because it needs to be changed. But particularly commercial, certain commercial uh, asset classes need to be redone. Yep. So you know, I would think that the a five seven year window would make a lot of sense. Yeah, especially from the asset level, that's usually like the, the sweet spot to really like maximize the profit in there, like maximize the return equity. Um, from a, 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 like a macro strategic, it's as long as the trend goes out. I mean, once the, once the trend stops going, once the trend is no longer my friend, like in this case, you know, I got into, I really got in the game like here seriously, so about halfway through. And now we're up here and I think that, I think that big trend pop is over, so I'm pivoting. And so when it kind of comes to commercial stuff, um, you know, I think we're going to see prices crash a little bit more and I'm not, I'm not, I never try to time the bottom of the market because stock trading taught me I suck at that. I'm happy to buy on the way down and buy on the way up. Um, and basically like, I think, you know, what, probably five, seven to 10 years will be like an amazing wave of growth. Like we saw in from 2011, 2011, 2012 on in Denver and, you know, the front range. So once that market shift changes, It'll be time for the next thing, but I think for the next ten years, this is like this will yeah seven to ten. This will be the strategy, at least for me. I think for like the best in the market. Now you know right now like multifamily is you know really good asset to buy, and there'll be some other commercial assets as they kind of go through their life cycles. But I think like seven to ten years for like me and this in general and for like the huge pop of the growth, and there'll be something else, and then you pivot to that, and then you pivot, you pivot, you pivot, and. No. Yeah, fun. Did I answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Yes. I know that this is a general metro projection, but do you see this in other areas, states as well? Yes. So from a very high level, like, um, and I, I've never liked using national data because it kind of just like, it's just like all the averages and it's really muddied and we all know, yeah. And what's the three words in real estate? Location, location, location. So, but for a lot of other markets, you're seeing similar trends. Like I think a lot of markets, the residential price is same thing, you know, huge uh, run up. They flatten out. Now some is dropping a little bit more. Some markets will get hit harder, but nothing like it was in 2008. And most markets overall, like similar trends, especially on the commercial asset classes, because that's really driven by like the debt coming due, which Denver or Des Moines or San Francisco, they're all facing the same issues. So yeah, from a high level, a lot of markets are seeing similar trends, um, but always dive into the local market. Where do you, I, I assume you live here. I do. do. you invest here or do you invest elsewhere? I invest in Des Moines. In Des Moines? Okay. What, uh, what type of properties? What's your, what's your plan? Multi-family right now. I have Perfect. Some, I have some Airbnbs, but multi-family. So you uh, multi-family and Airbnbs in Des Moines? Yeah. Cool. Yeah. From what I've seen from Des Moines data, I think they kind of follow a similar trend. And I think they'll be like, from an interesting standpoint, like I, I, like I said, the trend is your friend. Like I think their markets like Des Moines being one of them, like they have potential to have like a big pop like Denver did the last 10 or 15 years where, hey, it's a you know, relatively affordable market, um, good economy, it's stable, all that. I think there'll be some markets like that where they can like pop again and hopefully like you can catch that wave. What are all the different metrics you keep track of where you get the information to identify existing trends and potential changes in trends? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, so I, I consume a lot of information. I just, I read a lot and go to a lot of webinars. So like, uh, you know, like your castle, which is a lot where this data came from. Um, if you guys ever want like too much data, let me know. We got like a thousand pages of slide decks. So like your castle, especially Lon Welsh, who's a data, I mean, like just brilliant data guy. I learned a lot from him. A lot from just mentors have reading, you know, Wall Street Journal as well. But um, years ago, when I was first getting into real estate, like I did, I think a lot of people did, is I spent months, maybe a year or so, trying to figure out, oh, what market should I invest in? What's this? What's this? What's this? What's this? And like, I spent a year and did nothing. And so I really boiled it down to like one or two very simplistic things. Like, hey, what is the one big trend that's going to drive everything else? And for me, that's just like, hey, where, you know, hey, look at prices in Denver, like they're gonna be stabilized. And I go back and look at every data point, I'm like, I can't talk myself out of this big trend. So I try to simplify it to like one big trend. And to me, that's, it's either growing or shrinking. 
rising or sinking. So like, hey, the market is growing. The population is growing. The job market is growing. Prices are going up or prices are going down. And so I kind of go for some very big trends. Is it growing or shrinking in one of those forms? And I really focus on that trend. And I look at a bunch of data that I, I either support it um, or I talk myself out of it. But I, I really focus on like one or two big trends because I've noticed, at least for me, like I'm a big picture person. I get like, try to like master every data point. I just spin my wheels and do nothing. Yeah, exactly. I'm happy to take questions or if anyone wants to like put yourself in the hot seat or ask your own questions, that's way more fun. How do you find your properties? So at Atlas, we have 9,000 units under management. So if someone is retiring or wants to move up into a level, we'll get those off market, do the investor classes and they bring us off market. How are you analyzing those or are you buying them on the market? Uh, it's been a little bit of both. And by the way, is anyone not on uh, Jen's and Atlas's like uh, deal list? Definitely email her or whatever the best way is to. Like I've been on there for a while. Like they're, I mean, they are consistent. There's good deals in there. Like I would definitely like that's one way is you get on you network like that. Um, for me, a lot of the deals have come from networking. Um, and the last you know couple of years, the majority was MLS. Like you know that's where we found a lot of the deals. Where hey, you could go out there and like. I never look for the grand slam deal. I look for a really good deal. And I'm happy like living in that metric. Uh, so for me, about half my properties came from MLS, half came from networking. Uh, I've done a few deals with wholesalers. But uh, for me as an investor and for me as a real estate broker, it never worked really, it never worked well for me because it was just like the speed. Like, oh, it's 10 a.m. on a Thursday. Hey, we got this property. Can you be here between 12 and 5 and drop off a cashier's check? I'm like, uh, I'm no, I've got like webinars and kids to do. Um, so like a lot of times that didn't work for my speed where like, I'm not the fastest, but I'll, I'll ride the trends. So like networking and MLS, um, and then just like the deal list that's networking. And how do you get people off the fence? I've been doing groups like this for about 10 years. And when I do a class like this, there's two or three people that are really excited and they're ready to move. And the other people want to do analysis and they look around and they talk to their friends. And then like the next year, they're like, I'm ready. I want that house, you know, for 300,000 in Denver. And I'm like, well, it shifted, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. So other than you do your webinars and your, what do you think in the spirit of someone? Is it lack of education? Is it fear? Is it like not being in the right circles? Because my family told me not to invest because it's foreign, right? Like you pay oh, off yeah. your house, you have your mutual funds, and then you retire. You don't do that. That's really risky. And now what do they say? Oh my gosh, that's so stable. If you ever got in trouble, you have all these safety nets, right? Yeah, and 10 but years ago, you're the dumbest person in the room. I was, because the, mar <laughs> yeah. the market was declining. Well, I know. Like, People are like, what are you what doing? Are you doing? <laughs> yeah. But what is in your spirit that's different? And what do you see in other people? Like, how do you get from here to here the fastest? So I, I will preface this with one thing. And this is a lot of us, hey, we all, we're all looking at deals. We're all, a lot of us are business owners too. So like from a very high level, like I look at funnels and the wall of averages. So like um, from like the, the, the high level point, like, I find it very hard to try and make more people do things. It's usually like, yeah, two or three people out of a group will actually take action and do it. So from like, hey, I, if I want more deals or if I want more business, I put more people in the funnel or I put more deals in the funnel is like the high level of it is just, hey, it's very hard to like go against the law of averages. Uh, who's familiar with the 80-20 rule or who's not familiar with it? Do we have anyone? No one's going to admit to it. So, you know, that's where it says, hey, there's a few, 20% of what you do accounts for 80% of the results you have. And this works in investing. It works in sales teams. It works in economics. It works in like, hey, usually it's like 5 to 20% drives everything you're doing. And the rest is noise. So um, I have learned from that, like, I can only, I've, I've gone through phases where I've, like, I've wanted it more than the person has. And I've, like, broken my back while they're, like, not ready for it. So from like a high level, I'm like, hey, just more people in the system, more deals in the funnel, that'll lead to more throughput. But from actually like helping people along the way, I think it's education and then like personal strategies, whether it's like a mastermind, like, hey, go, I, I use gym, hey, go to the 5 a.m. workout class or go, you know, do, do a group mastermind or go to your 5 a.m. and work out with your workout buddy, you know, one-on-one -on -one, or go do a group. And I think that like, that type of intention um, and being around those people is a key part to it. 
And I think people that get into that space, they're more likely to uh, have success. So can't fight the law of averages, uh, but you know, for people that want to take it, I think, it's, I think it's education, but preface that with education's only as good until you take action. Like you don't need to know everything in the world. Um, but I think the most important thing is like getting connected with people, like meetups like this, uh, masterminds or do one-on-ones with people. Like I think it's that intimate stuff that really makes a big difference. And when you get the opportunity to like sit down and like get Jen's perspective on how to analyze a deal or what to do, like you take it. Um, and you take everybody you can from her. Or, you know, I had, uh, did anyone know Charles Roberts around Denver for years? Okay, cool. So he was like my first main mentor out here. And man, every minute and a half, that guy, I just, I, I valued it. So like, look for opportunities to learn from people and be around people that are, you know, more successful in some areas. And when you get the opportunity, man, be prepared and learn from them. And I think tying it to a why as well. Like, am I going to look at my son and say, you don't get to go to college because oh, I didn't yeah. prepare? Or my daughter, you don't get your medicine because I didn't prepare? You know, like this last weekend, the state made a decision on whether they were going to continue paying for my daughter's drug. And she has, she was born with a fatal illness, right? And then they came up with a gene therapy. The gene therapy is 200000 a year, but it gives her a normal lifespan. She'd live to be 80. So the state was like, well, are we going to pay, continue paying for this drug? And if not, these 500 people have to move, right? It was on the Denver Post. I was in that article. But you know what my daughter said to me? She said, well, mom, what would happen to me if this passed? She said, you would move me out of state. I would have access to my medicine. She said, the other people, they would die. And like, that's an extreme story, but you have to have your resources and you have to, like the people around you are watching. Yeah. What are your resources? How can you take care of your people? How can you take care of yourself? And then how can you impact the community, right? Because when we, it's like that, that pyramid of needs at the bottom is physical and at the top is giving back. And you're at the top now. You're, you're here, you're talking to people, you're, you're sharing your, your knowledge and your successes. And, and that's amazing. That's a win for your yeah. life and for other people, right? So yes, absolutely. You. You're welcome. I, I totally agree with the why. Um, if you guys don't have like a, a clear, clear why, um, I totally agree with it. Now, I don't think, I, I, I wouldn't, I don't think we can coach people into why. Like, I'm sorry, if you don't have a why or a goal, I, I'm, man, I don't know what to tell you. Like, you gotta get one. Doesn't everyone? I, I mean, <laughs> in this room, I think yes, but like, I would put this in like the winner, the people here are like the winner's portion of the population, but a lot of people out there don't have that. Uh, and I'm like, if you don't have a why, I don't know what to tell you. Just like, you have to figure it out. Like, you have to. It is um, personal. Yeah. Like, but yeah, you have that and man, just, work towards it. Anyone want to share their why? Sure. Oh, well, thank you. So, Julie and I, we are the kids. We have uh, three. <laughs> Four-legged kid. My sister, Julie has a brother and sister. each have two kids. So, we, we moved to Denver in 2018. Um, we met Chris Rock when we moved here. Uh, we started investing in property and we just set the trust. And so, our why is to break build enough for the portfolio that uh, nieces and nephews will each get a six each and they can follow their passions in life, do whatever they want to do. But we're also trying to teach them about real estate so they can make smart decisions with what we believe in. So that we might come time soon. Awesome. Thank you. And uh, they, they're big into Airbnb and you guys are, have probably, make sure everyone saw it, you guys probably saw this on your seat. Uh, they also do a lot of video, video stuff, videography, to put it simply. Um, and Julie is working on a compilation of what Airbnb landlords to fight the 4x tax increase you guys are facing. Yeah, this one, one keep, yeah, just a little sound bite from you. You don't have to even invest in short term rentals, but of course, my property tax is just stupid, hmm. you know, no matter what. So we have this little video where we're gonna put it together and it's some really sad music, send it to all the <laughs> legislators and make cry and hopefully go. Yeah. Yeah. And I and I'm <laughs> And if you guys wanna do it, I mean I'm you know, uh Julie has an iPhone, just go record with her real fast maybe too, get it done, right? No time like the present? <laughs> you want submissions? Take action. What about, what's your why? 
I'm, or are you still figuring it out? I'm still figuring it out. I mean, I, I have a, I'm, I'm going to be a uh, grandfather very soon. Congrats. In well, in May, so not super soon, but so that you know, my daughter's always been my wife. And, yeah. Uh, helped me through, you know, through all the rocky times, just having someone else to focus on. So I have that as my wife, but I, as far as you know, once she, she's 24 now, so you know, once she moved out, it was the wise change because mm. it, you know you're you don't have all those responsibilities that you have. But now, with a you know, with a grandkid coming in, um, is she local here? Yes. Oh, cool. So, with the grandkid coming in, it's it's like, well, what can I do to pass on to you know knowledge in that way because I want. To I do want to see, you know, whatever leg up in life that, that I can give or, you know, um, knowledge, you know, because when you're younger and you, you have kids, you know, everyone, no one can claim that they know what the fuck they're doing, excuse my language. You know, we just have to pretend that we know what we're doing and do the best thing that we can. Yeah. yeah. And so I think... Make it till you make it. Yeah, well, and then, but... I think the older you get, then you, you know, it's just like with our own parents, you know, you think, well, I never, you know, I still have to learn my, by my own, making my own mistakes. My parents may have told me all these things, and, you know, I know better than you. Oh, yeah. So, you know, in, in one way, I can kind of get back to, you know, mm -hmm. uh, future family as well. I mean, so it sounds like you're, it, it, I mean. I've got that part. Yeah. I'm, I'm also, you know, I like I also like money. Yeah. So like you were saying, you know, So what's what's the next goal? My next goal is ten million dollars. Uh that's a big goal for me, but I was like, what? I mean Yeah, why not? Yeah, why I mean what's I mean I'd rather I'd rather die climbing the mountain. Than falling down it? Yeah, or just like <laughs> well, <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, I, one of my like, I just like I said, this is very. I just, I just need a goal of life. Like, if I don't have a goal, like I said, I just get very like unproductive and miserable. Like, cause you don't. Yeah, and I, I'm like, yeah. And I drive my, I, I wake up at five a.m. I'm go go go, and then nine p.m., nine thirty rolls around. I hit the pillow. I'm asleep. Like I'm either on or off. But like I don't have a goal in every part of my life. Like I'm, and I don't need to have like a lot of times like a really big why. I just need to have like I need the ball thrown for me, and I'm very happy with that. I, don't, I mean. I, I understand that as well. I mean, that's, yeah. it's a, it, for some of us, that's hard to operate that way. Just to, I mean, but to have a major goal and then to work towards that. Uh, so, you know, my, well, you know, team, I'm an aspiring investor as well as a lender, um, you know, the company I work for. So, um, I don't think that things are going to crash, 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 but I do think we're going to see a bigger cut. But you think we'll see prices drop some more? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but I just want to make a bet? I'd like to, yeah, I'll bet you that beer. I love it. Uh, I mean, yeah. 10%? Yeah. All right. Yeah, all right. Uh, but I, yeah, I, uh, I guess, you know, obtaining some, some of my own properties. Yeah. Guys, um, and but I don't want to take up all the time. No, I mean, well, this is the point of it. Like, the whole point is like, I mean, we all have to pivot. Like, I'm sorry, my, my, I feel like my job now is like, I'm just like, if, if you guys aren't pivoting, like, you're, you're crazy right now. Like, it's just in well, some form or the other. This job. Yeah. Absolutely love it. I mean, I absolutely love meeting most of the people that I meet. And uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> there are some real slime balls in real estate that you run into. Um, That's all population, yeah, though. Right, sure. Two, two, 2% two of population, no matter what industry you're, Slime balls and sociopaths. Right, but I, I, mean, I guess I was, I was in a, more of a uh, he has bureaucracy a type of job and where uh, I just had a lot of stuff to deal with like that. And there was no ladder to really climb because there was somebody who had to die or retire. Mm. And that, that stuff wasn't happening. So those goals weren't as achievable until I left that job. So uh, this just popped my mind. So I... I What's been the most productive for me in terms of like figuring out clarity? And this is when I was like, after I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, where I was like, I was like, that was like the most loss I've been in life. And then that like, that 
position period where like between like 2011, 2003, I was going from internet marketing to real estate. The, the biggest actually that helped me out both those times was um, I had a very hard time saying, hey, I want this, I want this, I want this. I focused on what my do not want. I do not want this, I do not want this. And man, when I did that, I was like, oh, I don't want this, I don't want this, I don't want this. And it was very clear. And you know, in colleges, I don't want to wear a suit and tie every day to work. I don't want to have to commute and wash in DC traffic. You know, obviously things have grown as you know I grow and problems get bigger. But like I've actually had the most benefit from a do not want list. And I learned that somewhere a long, long time ago. And it was actually like one of the best personal development things I've ever done. And I've had I share with a lot of people who've gotten a good benefit out of there. So if you don't have exact clear on where you want to go, start on clarifying on what you don't want. And it, for me, it has created so much clarity, and at least for the filtering process, if something comes across my desk, I'm like, oh, wait, no, I don't want that. No, 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 no. And that's actually been the most helpful thing to me. That's good. Yeah. yeah. Very powerful. Yeah. So, like, yeah, I, I would recommend doing that. All kinds of things. I don't know. And, dude, that's the thing. You're like, <laughs> what do you want? I'm not sure. What don't you Oh, this, 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 right? Yeah. Have you written them down? No. Yeah. yeah. Write them down, man. It's, it's. And then write a chapter. <laughs> Man, I can write a book on yeah. things I don't want. Well, there we go. And then, then, then you can buy me a beer over it while I review it because price isn't a crash. Hey, beer, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes? Do you have good recommendations for some good masterminds or like even where to find them? Yeah, so be more specific because I, I, I have gone through... I have been a part of some amazing masterminds, and I've been a part of a really a lot of crappy masterminds. And so I think it comes down to like having clarity on what you want. And also I'm a big fan of like, you know, because the mastermind is just a tool. Like, hey, is this the right tool for where I'm, where I'm at in life right now? So like, wh like what do you want? Uh, I'd like to grow my multi-gamer portfolio. Specifically, I'm going to have to do Okay. And are you, okay, so these are a lot of uh, like directly, like what size are you talking like two to four, five plus, mixture of both? Uh, yeah, I have a mixture of both. Okay. Um, I mean, one, I would say like this, I would definitely look at some of the masterminds i is doing, like this one. These might be some really good ones. I mean, we will be talking multifamily and doing some stuff um, in there. So like, and this is like, in terms of masterminds, I mean, this is, you're doing the slide deck like I was. <laughs> yeah. um, I mean, this is nothing. So like, oh, man. I think that Troy is a good one to reach out. Yeah, Troy has so many. I would really plug in. I know like, I know an initiative for like i -Core, part of like i -Core's pivot. So talking about pivoting here, they're pivoting more towards masterminds and being facilitators. Um, bye, Eric. Um, so like, I would definitely talk to Troy. He's an amazing connector. Um, Th this would be a good, simple intro one to get connected to a couple of people. Like, we'll walk some properties, all through multifamily investing. Do you have any recommendations? I mean, like Jen's meetups. I mean, she specializes in two to fifteen unit pro two to fifteen unit properties. Mm -hmm. um, I've seen like, you know, there's like the I'm trying to think of these names, like the Anthony Chara masterminds, and there's all like you know twenty, you know, ten, twenty, thirty thousand dollar masterminds. I am very wary of those. I have been a part of a couple really good ones, but most have been like, oh, I wish I spent the money elsewhere. So like, I don't have any like big name ones I can recommend very well. M my most powerful ones have been like organic ones. Yeah. yeah. Did you give me experience with Nate Barger, uh, with the Burn the Burn Method? With who? Uh, Nate Barger. I don't know that name, no. Who is that? Burn, it's a Facebook group that's free to join called Burn Best. And Nate does a mastermind. I'm just curious if you have any of these. Yeah. And I think with most masterminds, I mean, you know, the, the problem if they're big enough, someone puts it on Google and half the people love it, half the people hate it, like anything else out there. And if they're small ones, you don't know. Um, I've had the best success with really being like a lot more organic, like coming to meetings like this, um, you know, trying to get 20 minutes of time with like someone I really respect and look up to. And that's been the best opportunity as opposed to like just going cold online and buying a mastermind. So I've, I'm sorry, not a very good answer for you. No, that's, that's a good answer. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, Troy. yeah, Troy would be amazing. Yeah, 
Well, that's part of this too. Like this will go, this just goes to like a journal application because right now I think Troy's focused on like there's a beginner mastermind, this portfolio one, and then a business mastermind as well for like more of the entrepreneurial side of people want to pivot in the market as like not just investor, but the business side. So those are three, I know the initial ones that uh, myself, Jen, Troy, and then Katie Fleming, who is also sick. Um, she's, we're helping to facilitate those. Yeah, she's, yeah. Yeah, we all talked Monday, it was all good to go. Then today, text, hey, we're all sick. Yeah, stay away. <laughs> yes. Um, I would imagine, so I would say, he'll email out, I would say go ahead, and so our, our process here is like, we wanna like, we have a rough idea, like a rough outline of the mask, like 80% of it done, like the stuff we've done, we've done in the past, but going back to like, hey, not just say, hey, here's what we're doing, it's like, hey, uh, especially since it's such an intimate community, like, hey, come fill it out, there's like 10 questions, and then, you know, it'll be just some like basic phone interviews just to get to know you, so you can get like, plug in the right one, but also, we can pivot or we can adapt the masterminds. Hey, we got 10 people want to do this. Let's change the focus from here to slightly change the course correction. So he, he really wants to make it. And this is why like, I, I don't like to charge for masterminds just because like they'd be so hit or miss, but with like Troy's vision of like, hey, the way you wanted to pivot i -Core and the way you really want to like tailor it to people. I was like, dude, I'm all in. I want to, I want to be a part of this and help you out. So like, just fill this out and I'll help with like the creating all the, the, de the details of it. Who's done good masterminds or bad masterminds? I like the answers. Charles, did you do it? I've never heard, yeah, how was it? Oh, I think that he's, he's, he's good. Okay, he's cool. Good. Yeah. You know, I, I'm kind of curious now because uh, he, he was in the big multifamily projects and uh, I want, I'm wondering how his financing, if the, the loans have come due and he's scrambling or, or just what he's doing, I haven't talked to him. So um, one of the really cool things I got to do that kind of helped led me to moving more towards like me investing into these passive deals and eventually pivoting my business into them was, obviously I do a lot of like content. Um, that's how I add value, I network, I bring investors, I, I funnel deals. But like the, the biggest reason I do the content is, um, it's kind of like the, the learn before you earn. You guys ever heard that in like personal development? Like I, it rhymes, so it has to be true. Uh, but it really, I, what I love about that is like the power of the microphone. I got to meet so many more successful people than I normally would if it was just like, hey, can I buy you a cup of coffee? Versus like, hey, I got a, a podcast and I love it like Charles Roberts. And so with uh, Bigger Pockets, um, this was 2020, so after COVID happened, um, I had the opportunity to go out there and do a, a YouTube show. It was about 25 episodes, I think, called the Multifamily Mentor Show. And as with my co-host, uh, Terrence Doyle, he invested in Des Moines as well in multifamily. So he would be, uh, he's very plugged in that market. Um, shoot me an email after this, actually. Um, his name is Terrence. Uh, yeah, what's your name? Heidi. Heidi, okay, yeah. Shoot me an email, Heidi. Um, I'm thinking about things. But anyway, he, he was pivoting his, but he did a lot of fix and flipping for years. He built a massive fix and thing, like hundreds of fix and flips, really scaled it, uh, then started buying rentals for himself to eventually, you know, retire one day. And then he started doing like some multifamily stuff and he started getting into like raising money in syndications. And so he wanted to like learn from other people. So we started this show called Multifamily Mentors. And it was a very unique spin. Like, hey, we got the Bigger Pockets name behind us, so we can kind of like, we can flex some. You know, it's not Chris and Terrence, it's Bigger Pockets. And we were like, hey, this is a bigger pocket show. If you want to be on it, you got to fly to Denver and be in person. So we got to meet the gamut of like some, some newbies, but also like we had Rod Cleef, we had Joe Fairless, uh, we had Brandon Turner, we couldn't record with him, but we met all these like super successful people and we got to spend like a day with them. Like not just record a podcast, but hey, we're gonna go out to lunch and then record a podcast. Let's go out to happy hour. Um, and it was like, it was an amazing learning experience from that. And so my point with all this is like, look for creative ways to learn from people. But I got to meet a lot of these very successful people like, oh my gosh, you have an amazing business. They have all this amazing stuff. And now some of these people, they're upside down their deals. And I never would have expected that two years ago. And now again, same like, you know, buyer beware, right? But these, some of these people are like, wow, you're like, I look up to you. You're, you're an amazing operator. You got a hundred million dollars in our assets. Like, you know, you, you can about walk on water when it comes to this stuff. And now I'm like, oh, Actually, no, 
You can't walk on water. Um, yeah, so like I can think of three people out of 24 I interviewed, um, two being pretty big names. Um, I was like, wow, you, you guys are getting foreclosed on some properties right now. And so like, it's just a good reminder, like, yes, while there's a lot of big names out there, um, you know, it's hard to tell what's really going on behind the scenes. Um, but if you guys ever have the chance, like totally off kind of ran, going off the top here of pivoting and looking for ideas to grow, like I've used content media to like really expand my network, get the amazing opportunity to like, you know, talk to everyone here. Um, if you're in niches, um, you know, the, the, the riches are in the niches. Like you can go out there and replicate the same model. Go, go learn from people, go do that, go get creative. And other ways to like get to be around a lot of successful people and learn ideas, you know, Airbnb, house hacking, investing out of state or women investing, you know, whatever it is, like there's a lot of cool niches out there to focus on um, and just have to get really good in the small niche. And that's all it takes. Go ahead, Heidi. I love it. Um, how difficult was it for you to start your podcast? Like, did you just wing it your first couple of podcasts? Yeah. So, uh, so the Denver podcast is not my first podcast. In my internet business, I had done two podcasts before, so I kind of knew that I knew the routine of it. Um, my biggest thing is I just committed to a goal. I said, if I'm going to start it, I'm going to do 52 podcasts at least. I'm going to do one a week for a year, approximately. You know, like that, that was my goal because I've done this and I've seen this. Like, how many people have seen, I call it like the pity Facebook page? Oh, I'm a brand new, whatever, realtor, investor, hard money lender, or whatever people start, and they get 20 people on their Facebook page, their mom, their dad, the couple of their friends, and it's like the pity stuff. And then, or they start a podcast, or they start, you know, vlogging, and they do five. F off. Like, you're going to do five of anything, expecting any traction? Give me an effing break. So, like... I focus more on quantity and commitment versus like in my mind, quantity led to quality for me. So I was like, hey, I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna do at least 52 of them. And once I've done it for a year, then I will sit back and evaluate if it's worth my time or not. Um, and you know, so I made the commitment. And then the nice thing is like, you guys have heard of Google, right? Go on to Google, type that out. <laughs> yes. Don't tell everyone the secret. Um, but like, I just went into Google and like, I just, you know, Googled it and, you know, a couple hundred dollars on microphones and that was it. Yeah. And now we have like a full production studio, but that, you know, kind of like how investors, you know, scale, hey, did fix and flip. Now they have like five GCs. Right. Same growth, just, you know, different model. Yeah. yeah. Did you pick out the 52 people that you were going to interview for those 52 that you... From the get-go? Yeah. Oh my gosh, no, I'm not that now. <laughs> I just planned the goal and went with it. And a lot of times it would just be like, uh, I, I, I leaned on Charles Roberts a lot. Like he was like, if you guys don't know, he was an icon around here in Denver real estate for probably like 20 years. He was one of the co-founders of Yearcast Real Estate, which is like the biggest independent brokerage in Colorado. Tons of investing, tons of teaching, and just like overall, like just amazing human. And so like, you know the phrase guilty by association? There's also success by association. And I was just like, Charles's guy. And I'm like, hey, Charles, what about this? Oh, talk to this guy. Great. Okay, introduce me to Mark Charles. Introduce me to Lon. But a lot of this came out like I was curious. I just like, oh, I want to I learn about this. I, I was always curiosity driven. And I'd be curious. And I would just go out there, go to networks. Uh, Bigger Pockets forums are an amazing place to meet people. And I would just meet people. And hey, go grab coffee with 10 people. And like one or two, like, wow, you're, you're legit. You're amazing. Can you be on the podcast? Okay. Yeah. And when was the, when Anthony Charles here three months ago? I think it was three months ago. Something yeah. like that. Yeah. He was in the hot seat. He's, he's legit. Yeah. What was his name? Anthony Charles. Yeah. He does a thing every, I think he's still doing it. His yeah. His monthly gig where he is an investor. Yeah, he has some great education. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad he brought it. I'm glad to hear it was awesome. Yeah, he, and he just, he's all about giving back. Yeah. He's, and he's very knowledgeable. Yeah. I mean, he doesn't always talk to talk. He walks through. Yeah. Yeah. Let's learn from the people that, uh, that are earning from what they do and not teaching and earning that way. I said that weird, but I think that's an important thing when you're going to those basketball. Yeah. Are you a real guru? 
Yeah. Or are you an Instagram guru? Yeah. Oh, I had $5,000 and mm. here you go. Well, I made all my money with all the people that signed up. For $5,000. Yeah. Yeah. Richard can bring a sports car around. We can all take photos in front of it for our Instagram page and, yeah. and act like we, we know what we're doing. I'm going to toy with a camera out there. Yes, Irene. In the syndications kind of bugs me a little bit. They, you said the bigger uh, syndicators and operators are underwater. Or well, so, some are. Some are. Are they still good operators and it's just the timing didn't work out? Or they made mistakes on the way. I think there's a little bit of both, but I would say I think what happened was I saw as underwriting, I think it kind of leads to like they probably made some mistakes, like deals are getting harder to pencil out. So, you know, hey, from, from hey, you got a tight buy box, lines get a little squishy. Um, oh, let's be a little more optimistic on our pro formas, like 8% rate growth forever. God, that'd be amazing, but we're not going to have that. So I think, I think it was definitely some market, but I can tell you there's, a, I know a lot of people um, where they, they bought right and they've not lost money, they've not foreclosed, they've not had an additional capital call, which means, hey, you put your money in here and now we need more money to you know, feed the refi loan. They've not done that. So I think it really comes down to like buying right or their strategy and people that stuck to their guns. Um, they're the ones that have like, hey, they've been doing deals for 20 years and they've, you know, they've never had a major loss or a major foreclosure. So I give it mostly on the operator because uh, did anyone expect interest rates to stay 2%, 3% forever? No. Um, they don't expect pro forma rent growth to go on forever. You shouldn't have. Um, so I, I put a lot of on the operator if they, now of course, hey, you're, all, you're never gonna bat a, a perfect. Like I never expect you're gonna bat perfect. But if you're taking some big losses and it came down to like your buy box got squiggly, yeah. Well, and there were a lot of externalities that entered into the market in the last four years. Oh. I think. I mean, COVID for one. Yep. Had an enormous impact in our, in our whole society, and real estate was part of it. Oh yeah, and I said there there are some big factors, um, but some people, a lot of people came out without you know unscathed on there. So I'm like, oh well. And just to pick random, like, you lost money, but you didn't. And we all lived in, on planet Earth in Colorado. What did you do? You know, like, that's what I want to know. Buying, like, stabilized assets at a free cap. I mean, that's, I think, in hindsight, it's a little bit I think, yeah, this is going to work. Yeah, and, like, to go to the extreme of, like, some of these, like, the, the, some of the people interviewed on this bigger pocket show, like, there were these two, two young guys. Um, and, they, I mean, gosh, I mean, they were, like, 20. 20 and 21. And they dropped out of college and they started raising money in you know, 2020. Um, and they, they took a couple apartment buildings down and they're, they're being foreclosed on now. Like, so there's things like that where it's like, well, almost like, what do you expect out of a 20-year-old guy? Like, hey, like, I love the, that, but I'm, if I'm going to give $100,000, I'd rather give it to Anthony Chara versus this young guy. You know, Anthony is amazing. Uh, this young guy, cool, you, you got the hustle, but learn on your own dime first. I think it's also timing. We did this one building in Arizona and they built this light rail station behind it, which is good because it adds, um, you know, like transportation. transportation for people. But during that construction, a lot of the people moved out. And so then our vacancy went up and our DSCR got shifted. And so Ooh. we fixed it. But sometimes weird things, it just depends on when the bank does its underwriting as well. So making sure that you're padded. Yeah. enough to uh, with reserves if you take on a value add project to know what's coming right oh yeah <laughs> the reserves yeah and always have more than you think you need yes. that's one of my biggest lessons <laughs> i call it my home depot oh okay i can do this project around the house you know in one weekend three weekends later and 10 home depot trips later that's my analogies for investing i always plan for here's my plan and i put an extra 10 percent buffer you have to find and... what's underneath <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that is asbestos up there, you know? Um, yeah. Damn. Uh, I think you, yeah. Yeah, I'm kind of curious on your thoughts on um, return on investment in the property. So I, I work multi family brokerage on that one. And a lot of times what I see with investors, a lot of times is, you know, it's, they're, they're not getting the question cleaned. It's, uh, you know, there's little things that they can be uh, pushing a rent seat higher. Um, 
got new laws to be taken from uh, uh, the Airbnb market, the things that we use to take, take from that and incorporate it into multi-family, you know, give, give the, the units of pizzazz in a sense, um, outdoor spaces, that kind of thing. But, uh, and, and you kind of were showing in your graph that on the two units, four units, that we're not seeing a lot of growth in that. Really yeah. That. And that's you know, definitely, we're, we're seeing that. Um, do you think now is the time just to put money and put some return on investment on those properties that there should be more focus on that? Uh, I mean, if the numbers make sense, like if you increase, you know, your NOI, your net, net, oper net operating income, because like, uh, make sure everyone understands it here. So like, you know, residential prices, one of four units, that's all based off a of sales comp. What do we all pay for these houses and fourplexes here? Commercial and apartment buildings, they're focused on more like the income of the property. And there's like, hey, there's top line revenue. And then also like, hey, if, if I have a 40% expense budget, off a million dollar building, but he has a 30% expense budget, his building's worth more because it's more profitable, has more net operating income. So I think, yes, if the NOI is there, absolutely. Um, and some of the stuff we've seen for like the, some of the value adds we've done is, um, you know, adding, yeah, a little better finish on there. You can make it pop a lot more for, for not much more money when it comes like rehabbing it. Outdoor spaces and dog parks. I'm not talking about like the, you know, the, the dog parks downtown, which are nicer than like my house that some of these class A apartment buildings have, but just like a, even a standard dog park, um, outdoor area, that's very attractive to people. Um, I think for a lot of these buildings too, you know, you look at all the, the 1960s build brick in Denver. Uh, yeah, a lot of success with just, man, just clean up and, and put good lighting. And that helps with security. That helps with getting that. If you just do a lot of basic stuff, um, seeing rents go up and then obviously, you know, try to like, you know, squeeze expenses out as much as possible. So would you focus some more on like, what's your, what's your, what's your niche for multifamily? Du duplex about 10 units. Okay. Yeah. Wow. So that's kind of what we specialize in. What, what uh, shop are you with? Oh, uh, what's the West Speed properties? Oh, cool. Yeah. Oh yeah. I know. Oh, awesome. Yeah. They're, those guys are great. Yeah. Before I got, got, got involved in them, I was actually with a property management company doing all the leasing in the first couple of years. And uh, I've just seen it a lot of times where it just felt like that, you know, the, a lot of times the units were, the, the, the last tenants cleaned it, that's good enough. And, you know, you're, you're, you know, from a leasing standpoint, you're trying to lease up, like, just, just a little bit more would just make such a big difference on these properties. And I, I kind of get at a point where I, I really, even with my clients, I'm really kind of preaching that whole return on your investment. The little things really, really do count. You know, it may be something about removing the beats in the back and, Putting out some mulch and some, yeah. some patio, uh, crushed, you know, crushed uh, stone. Uh, really, kind of, you know, it's easy and very inexpensive. Really, can I clean up a place? Yeah. Pay in a cleaner, go in a cleaner. Right? Yeah. Right. What? Well, I mean, I think also a lot of times, like, especially those properties, like, I think there's a lot of opportunity in like that that small type of you know, you know, small multifamily. Um, uh, you know, good marketing, like, geez, like, take get professional listing photos or go out there and do a professional listing video. Like we've seen some really good results from that with like some of the people we've partnered with. We may be able to like, yeah, it takes a little more expense, but they get a lot more run out of it because you use it for a couple of years as well. I think all those properties are just, they're piss poor marketed. I mean, so Jen's got really, because you know, she, she does a lot of focus in like two to 15 unit apartment buildings. Um, you know, a lot on the brokerage side, but also a lot of the insight from the, the, the PM side of Atlas, like, what, what what would you say to that in terms of like other ways to optimize NOI and like opportunity out there? Uh, the ways to optimize. So you look at what is building around you. We got a a, a four unit and we bought it for four ninety five probably in, in twenty eighteen. And you let it ride, right? And then the development went all around it. And then I, I noticed, you know, hey, you're renting your your building for sixteen hundred a door across the street's twenty two hundred your building looks awful, right? So then we had to put 100,000 into it, but now it's worth a million five. So it's buying in the right area. And then in order to get those rents, we had to renovate it. We had to look at what the 2,200 a month and then do that. So we had to do new floors, we had to do stainless, we had to do granite, we had to do lighting, we had to paint the exterior, right? Like it had to match. So just knowing, but then you don't wanna over improve as well, right? Like I've been working We've with all Mike, done that. Mike Hills for a long time and we'll go and we'll do a house. And he's like, well, what do I need to do to sell it? Should I fix this driveway? I'm like, what? 
we're not going to fix the driveway. A woman picks this house, and then we, the man fix, you know, looks at the mechanicals. <laughs> we're doing the backsplashes. We're doing these different things. And so just like, and then figuring out how inexpensive you can get it done or adding a, a room. But that's what I specialize in is just like walking mm. properties and how do we get the rents up and then what is the calculation. And then if you have like Atlas has the 9,000 properties behind it, I can make those appraisals, right? Because I can say, no, here's your comps. And these aren't just on Zillow, maybe. These are actual leases. Yeah. And so it's valued at this and just always meeting the appraiser out. And there's lots of tricks that you learn along the way. I think with your PM background, I don't know uh, your you know your brokerage you know what you're doing and take the grain of salt since I don't specialize in that area. But like I see a huge opportunity where a lot of times those mom and pop owners like they're smart enough to buy and they just don't know how to operate the property. You help them figure out how to optimize their NOI and help do that. Like I know a lot of multifamily brokers they don't have that PM experience, and I think that's a huge advantage, um, especially like that where you know that drives the revenue increase. I would, I would put a marketing campaign around that or put a couple of case studies around like sending out to people like, hey, we did this for, you know, this duplex, uh, you know, over here in, in West Denver. Let me send it to you and like put together some plans or tips like that. Like, I think that'd be a good marketing outreach and like, you know, people would find that And then make helpful. your pro forma right because the experienced investors, if they don't see the expense <laughs> yeah. ratios that are correct and they look at the rents and the rents are padded and then the expenses aren't like that's. So if you look at a rent, like, and let's use that property in Castle Rock and it's 2000, but it includes the water trash, all the things. So you have to put that on the pro forma. If you miss that. They'll just, they'll be like, this whole thing is wrong. And they'll just shut the computer, yeah. you know? So your numbers have to be accurate. And so I uh, went back to, this is that, that 32 year part. I don't have the before photos, but you can see this is like, this is a class C building. Now it's probably like a class C plus or B minus, but they, they put a dog, dog park here in the, middle and then all the units like this is all you know uh luxury vinyl plank um pretty common backsplash but like you had the accent wall on there like it just it looks really good on photos and like you're out there looking at other like class c properties on on apartments.com or zillow like what pops to you this pops over the the crappy photo with my finger on my block and half my iPhone lens that someone took, you know? And you renovated that whole building. That's not just one of the mm. units because that's the classic trick, right? Like oh, no. They, <laughs> it, it, it was all of them. No. Uh, it was all of them. I, I wish I could take credit for it, but no. Uh, uh, yeah. But, like, I mean, like, simple things like that. Like, I mean, you don't see that in classy buildings, but, like, they get a lot of ride out, like, just doing some, like, accent walls. And it, just, it pops so much. And they, and they beat they beat market rents consistently. What are you seeing with, with rents right now, especially with property management company or at Atlas? Are you seeing rents kind of maintaining or kind of? They're maintaining. And a lot of people in the C-class are moving because they're getting hit, right? Like with expenses, I think um, the student loan payments that started back up again, it pinched people. I'm, I'm not sure exactly why, but the vacancy is up a little bit right now, so you have to be careful. And if the vacancy is up, then buildings that are renovated are gonna go first, right? Because there was a, a time when everything was just renting for more and people got really lazy. And so I think you have to do it right. You have to call people back right away. You have to have your units cleaned, you know, keep an eye on the expenses and then you'll be okay. Yeah. Isn't Denver's population decreasing now? Like the last two years is the first time that people are I think I think Denver County did. Um, I think Denver County saw a slight increase, or I'm sorry, slight decrease. Yeah, the suburbs actually all saw an increase. Now I know Colorado as a whole, like the statewide population growth has slowed down. I think we're doing like 50, 60, 70 thousand new people here now. It's like 20 or 30 thousand. So the population growth is still positive, but it has slowed. And it's also winter that yeah. has the seasonality is huge. There's probably like $300 difference if oh, you yeah. went in December versus the springtime, you know, so that's a lot. Oh yeah. You don't, you don't want to be renting November, December timeframe. You, you will, if you have to six month or 18 month lease and get it turned into like the spring, summertime. But like here, I know you can't, the charts will cuff on the left there, but like the, uh, the top part up here is vacancy. Uh, and this part is the median rent. And so this is from the uh, data from Apartment Association of Metro Denver. So they're like the big group around here. 
So that dotted purple line up top uh, matches up with 6% vacancy. And historically, we've seen Denver, and this is apartment buildings, not single family homes. Once things hit 6% vacancy, rents usually flatten out, has been the data from the Apartment Association. So you can see here, like, you know, vacancy really dropped. Rents went up. And as vacancy is dropped, rents go up. So vacancy is drifting up, uh, and just rents are flat now. And I've been hearing that on the data and across all the property managers, especially like the Class C stuff. And the rental laws are not helping, right? Because if you only need two times the monthly rent in order to get qualified, which is a state law, then the eviction rate goes up. Yep. Cool. All right, so I know, I think I'm gonna wrap it up here. So speaking of pivots, does anyone wanna to commit to writing a chapter in here? Sure, sure. Come on. I'll write your chapter. All right, I got Jen, we got <laughs> Alex, we got Heidi. Got Matt, got Richard. Richard and his sports car. Yes. <laughs> Guys, write your chapter. It's really good. Like, uh, I honestly I say it as like a self, you know, it's, it's self fulfilling for me to help publish the book. Because, like, we have 40 people in this uh, book here, and I talk about playing games. My goal every year is I have to have more people than I did in the book last year. I gotta keep the growth going. So I need some of that, but also like for clarity, for pivoting, like writing a chapter in here, it sucks, it's hard, but like actually having to write it out is so therapeutic and gives so much clarity. So like it, it's hard, but the benefit is huge. We all know the power of written goals, right? Write it. So, all right, so I'm gonna get with you people afterwards who write in the chapters. I'm gonna take your photo with me, so I remember I'm gonna harass you. <laughs> your address, yeah. your driver's license. Just, just your social security number, mother's maiden name, uh, and we're good. <laughs> um, cool. thanks, Chris. Yeah, thanks guys, this was, this was awesome. And, uh,